So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this presentation. So we've got Nicola Savory with us today. Nicola is qualified as a registered general nurse in 1986. In 1988, Nicola qualified as a midwife and since then she has worked in a large maternity unit in South Wales in the UK. Over the last seven years, alongside her clinical duties, Nicola has worked as a research midwife, coordinating several studies within the unit. Three years ago, Nicola was awarded a fellowship to undertake a full-time PhD at Cardiff University. This study aimed to understand the experiences of women with mild to moderate mental health problems in pregnancy and the experiences of midwives who support them. Nicola has continued to work clinically alongside her studies. Her clinical and research interests include antenatal care of pregnant women, induction and early labour, women's and midwives experiences, relationships between women and midwives, and service provision as well as perinatal mental health. It gives me great pleasure to pass on the mic to Nicola. Nicola, you might just have to unmute your mic at the bottom of the slide and you should have control now. Welcome. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Perfect. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, hello and thank you for joining this session. Um, thank you for coming all over the world to listen to this session. That's uh, quite astoundingly. <laughs> um, I'm speaking to you from Wales in the UK. If you have any questions, like Ali says, if you can type them in the chat box and I'll try and answer them at the end. I might not be very good at looking at the questions and answers while talking through the presentation. Um, so this presentation is based on my PhD, which was funded by the Research Capacity Building Collaboration, and they fund nurses, midwives and allied health professionals in Wales to undertake research. So this study came about from my own clinical practice as a midwife um, and observing other midwives caring for women. And I had observed that many midwives were a bit frightened of looking after women, especially with severe mental health conditions. Um, and also in my own practice, I was not too sure what to do if a woman approached me or disclosed that she had an issue with her mental health. I wasn't too sure where to send them. So that was the basis of why I decided on this topic. Um, so the perinatal period is usually defined as pregnancy and up to a year after birth. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I've jumped all the way through the slides now. <laughs> we'll get back to the right slide in a minute. Okay, so the background to the study when I was looking at previous research was concentrating on women's experience of probably postnatal depression more than the antenatal period. And they'd also a lot of research about experiences of women with severe mental health diagnosis. Um, but research is emerging to suggest that what happens in the womb has short and long term consequences for the child. And there's also, also an economic cost for society with the long term care of the child affected by the negative um, outcomes of poor mental health. So the aims of the study were to explore the experiences of pregnant women with mild to moderate mental health issues and the midwives who care for them. Um, and I'd chosen women with mild to moderate mental health issues because they can't access the services that are provided the perinatal mental health team who provides services for women with severe mental health issues uh, and they're usually cared for by midwives and by the general practitioner so i wanted to explore this area so before i start i've got a quick poll similar to the one that ali had so the first question um, i just want to know because you've come from all over the world have you got any services in your health service for specialist, um, specialist perinatal mental health services for women with severe mental health issues? So I'm just going to put the poll up on the right hand side and then you should be able to. Is that coming up? No. OK. 
Okay, thank you. Oh. Well, it seems to be an overwhelming majority that have got specialist services, so that's reassuring. I know most of the UK has now, has now got some service in place. Thank you. Oh, still a few more people responding. Give you a couple more minutes. Okay, I'm going to stop that there. So yeah, about 41%, 40, 77%, uh, that's a good majority of, of the people with specialist services. So the other question, um, which is the area I was looking at, was I wondered if you had support services for women with mild to moderate mental health issues. So by that, I'm thinking about women, um, not specific services for birth trauma or for bereavement but more a general service that cares for women's mental health. So again, I'm gonna put the poll up and then you can vote. Okay. There still seem to be quite a good percentage of uh, services for women with mild to moderate mental health issues. I'd be interested to know what they are, but I can't ask you all individually. OK, so I'm going to stop the poll and publish the results now. <clears throat> so again, about 77 percent compared with 29 percent have got services for women. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> so next I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the background to the study and the way it was set up. So it was a multi-method um, study. And I was speaking to women who had questionnaires in early pregnancy um, and to midwives as well. So in early pregnancy, women were offered a questionnaire which included the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale and the General Anxiety Disorder Screening Tools. And these were to assess what their levels of anxiety and depression symptoms were at the time. Um, in that questionnaire, I also invited women to express an interest in coming to an interview later on in pregnancy. I'm not going to report on the first phase of the study. I'm going to um, concentrate on the interviews with women and the feedback from the midwives as well. So the midwives were also provided with a questionnaire and some of them came to a focus group as well to discuss their experiences of caring for women with um, mental health issues. So this is um, the timeline that I used with women. And I conducted 20 interviews with women in late pregnancy. They were all over 34 weeks of pregnant, pregnant by the time I spoke to them. Some of them were actually due on that day. Um, and the women had mild to moderate mental health issues as assessed on the early um, screening tools. So this timeline I gave them when they were invited to the interview. Um, and to give them a chance of thinking about their moods and emotions over time, thinking about how they thought their emotions were in early childhood through to adolescence, pregnancy, and you can see right up until the future, sort of after they'd had babies. And this formed part of the discussion during the interview. And some of these women had actually obviously looked at this timeline. One woman I went to speak to, I asked her one question to you know, ask her how her moods and her emotions had been and she gave me an hour long story from childhood all the way through to the present day um, of how her moods and emotions were. So I didn't have to ask much in that interview. So some of the themes that came out, um, there were three themes that came out from this research. And the first one, I, when I was talking about moods and emotions and over a time period, um, women described adolescence and, child and ad um, adulthood as a time when they perhaps experienced changes in their moods and emotions and their mental health. And it was usually big changes such as leaving home or going to university that seemed to trigger some of these issues. Um, women suggested that their moods were affected once they got to pregnancy by the early symptoms of pregnancy, which is understandable, tiredness, early morning sickness and the worry of miscarriage. And then during pregnancy, women mentioned, several women were mentioned in particular, 
the emphasis on the importance of feeling babies move, which we know is really important. But this did become quite an issue for some women and actually led to more anxiety. Um, and even though they were concerned about the baby's health, they were felt as though there was such an emphasis on baby's movements. They seemed to spend a long time trying to work out was their baby moving? What was the pattern they were supposed to expect? Um, and it's an area that is obviously a concern for women. Um, and then several women described how they actually hadn't enjoyed their pregnancy. They really, um, one woman said, I hated it. And she had extreme anxiety and concerns about the health of her baby all the way through pregnancy. Um, it might have been because she was a healthcare professional. She actually looked after sick babies. That probably was part of the reason. But she was really, really anxious and stated how she really hated pregnancy, which to me as a midwife was a bit of a shock. I hadn't perhaps realised that how many women did not like pregnancy. Um, and it actually led to her asking for an elective caesarean section for the birth of her baby so that she could reduce the risks as much as possible. Um, and at the time of the interview, like I say, women were mostly over 34 weeks pregnant by then. Um, some women were discussing perhaps fears around birth or just worries around birth, not real fears. And then and a few women, um, like the quote there, says that they were thinking more about, especially first time mums, how they were going to look after the baby afterwards. Um, I can see a few comments about the EPDS as a scale for looking at anxiety and depression. Um, I did do a, a big review on the scales and looking at picking up anxiety and depression symptoms in pregnancy. And it's I just had to use something as a way of working out which women to speak to in the interviews. So, yes, I know there are problems with different scales and how how accurate they are at um, picking up women's sort of anxiety levels and depression levels. Um, but it was for practicality practical reasons that I chose one of it, that scale. So the next slide, I'm looking at um, another theme, the expectations and control. Women seem to put an awful lot of pressure on themselves. They talked about their expectations and how they were worried about what other people thought. And they compared their the women with previous children, compared their parenting style to others. There was a lot of guilt expressed by women, with one of the women using the words in relation um, to having a previous assisted delivery by forceps. Um, she felt guilty that she'd let her daughter down. I didn't explore that further, but that was an interesting and worrying comment to me. And there was a lot of frustrations about women not being able to go for a run as the pregnancy progressed. And also some women were worried that they had had to pass some of their household tasks as a cleaning over to their partners and they actually felt some guilt and frustration over that as well. There are lots of everyday practical issues which cause stress and anxiety. Um, another issue that came over quite strongly was that caused stress was a lack of control. Some women were saying this was because they were busy, they were not able to get on top of things. Um, and others were suggesting ways of overcoming this issue by being organised and a couple of women by actually asking for an elective caesarean section so that they could be organised in their lives and knew what to um, what to expect. Um, some making very detailed plans. One lady was explaining how she made detailed plans about going on holiday and she, she had seconds sort of ideas about how to cope with everything. She had spares of everything and that was her way of overcoming this control and reducing stress. Um, and another lady explained how she has sort of an ABC plan of how labour would go and what to do in each, in each scenario. And she felt that this prepared her and her husband ready for their forthcoming birth and it helped again to reduce her stress levels. Another issue that came over was the interaction between midwives and women. Um, and sometimes women felt they weren't getting enough information from healthcare professionals. There was um, one woman who had been diagnosed with a group B um, infection and another where her baby was found to be in breach presentation. And they both felt that they weren't fully informed, that they did not have all the information or enough information to make an informed decision. Um, and this led to anxieties. And they were uncertain about the 
options that were available to them and this made them feel out of control. So an attempt to gain some control um, and be informed and reduce anxiety, women spent a lot of time looking for information and I looked through the information and came out with these um, statistics about well, 19 out of the 20 women actually looked for information via some form of technology. Google was a big um, way of looking for information. Some women just suggested they put um, whatever they were looking for in the search engine and then just looked at the first site that appeared. Um, there were in women had different ideas over chat rooms. Some found it a place um, of contradictions and the conversations made them feel uneasy and didn't help them at all. However, there was one woman with severe early morning sickness and she felt that the support, the emotional support she got from people in this chat room and the comfort in knowing that people were going through the same issues as her, she felt that was a real support to her. Um, and you can see that a few people actually relied on health professionals for information. But reassuringly, when I was asking you know, who they were speaking to and what they were asking about, women tended to rely on healthcare professionals if it was something to do with a complication of pregnancy, so such if they wanted to talk about cesarean sections, um, or if one lady had a centre previa, then they would ask health professionals those questions. It tended to be um, when they were going online, just Google Insights, it tends to be looking more at general development of the baby and pregnancy as it progressed. Um, and I was a, a bit surprised, maybe I shouldn't be, but the age didn't seem to be a factor. And one of the younger women in the interviews was actually one of the ones that least relied on technology and actually was more likely to you um, speak to health professionals because she felt she didn't have the ability to work out what was reliable information and what wasn't. So the other theme that came out from the women was their knowledge or their lack of knowledge and some of the conversations that they had with women. So women weren't too sure if a change in their mood was down to the hormones, whether it was part of their character. Women were not sure if it was normal for pregnancy or when they should ask for support and for extra help. Um, and one woman actually thought that poor mental health could only occur after the baby was born. I think she didn't have that, at that minute problems with her moods and emotions, so it just hadn't been an issue that she had spoken to anyone about or any discussion she'd had with anyone else or her friends. Um, and stigma was also something which was brought up by women that made them afraid to ask questions or to talk about their emotions and their mental health. Um, they didn't want to discuss that with their friends or work colleagues and some people didn't even want to discuss issues with their family. And when it came to their antenatal appointments with their midwives or GP or the consultant, um, this comment came up a few times. Um, if they were asked, how are you feeling? That sort of opening question, how are you feeling today? We, we weren't too sure whether that was just an opening question, whether it was relating to how the pregnancy was going or whether healthcare professionals were actually asking how they were feeling themselves, physically, uh, sort of emotionally. Um, and women appeared in the antenatal appointments to be more concerned about their baby's health. They were saying, as long as my baby's OK, then I'm OK. So they weren't really thinking about themselves and perhaps what they needed um, and their emotions. So most of the antenatal appointments appear to be on the physical aspects of um, pregnancy, looking after the mum and baby. I know in our um, health sort of board we've got a list of questions so you do women's blood pressure you do the temperature have to check urine and all those other things and emotions tends to come last on the list of um, tasks to do if you want to call them tasks and both of these resulted in sort of emotions not being discussed so lack of time and physical um, aspects of pregnancy for women who 
were aware that maybe their mental health wasn't quite as um, good as it should be or deteriorating. They suggested talking to their partners was a way of helping. Some people talk to family members, especially a female family member, so mothers and sisters, um, or friends who had been pregnant before. There was a lot of support from people that had been through similar situations and that peer support. Um, and a support network was mentioned by several women. So they perhaps used their husbands for the practical childcare, their mothers for the emotional support, and they might speak to their friends and just talk to them, even if perhaps their friends weren't listening. They found talking was sort of therapeutic in itself, even if they didn't get answers. Women also discussed about self-help and how if they recognised they were getting a bit stressed, um, that they had either time alone, that they went and had a rest, they went out for a meeting with their friends. They all had different ways of supporting their emotional help when they recognised that they needed that bit of extra extra help or rest. Um, and there was also a lot of discussion around support from antenatal groups. They seemed to be especially enjoy groups which had education, exercise and peer support all together. Um, and with us, a lot of people talked about National tri Birth Trust um, type of groups where the partners went as well. And they were suggesting that it was actually the peer support that was more important than the educational aspect or the information they received. And sometimes the peer support outside the groups, they really held on to this as something that's really important. So that was the um, women and the interviews with the women. And then I also um, talked to midwives of the questionnaire and the focus group. So before I get onto that bit, a bit more work for you. So wherever you're working, whether you're a student or a midwife, or if you're working with women um, in pregnancy and after pregnancy, I was wondering, do you formally assess women's mental health at each appointment? So is there a specific question in your um, notes that you have or do you use um, the screening tools obviously I can't get the individual responses but just a yes or no as to whether you have a formal way of assessing um, women's moods and emotions each time you see them so I'll put the poll up now and then just click on the poll there's probably just over half the amount with a formal assessment it's very difficult because I suppose there's different ways of calling it a formal assessment, but just a rough gauge. Okay, I'll stop that one. So we've got about just over 50% saying there's some sort of formal assessment, um, and 41% without. Okay, and then, um, so we have got questions in our um, booklet and I'll discuss about that a little bit later on how midwives went around asking questions um, of the women. So the next one is have you had any training to assess women's mental health in pregnancy? So specific training of how you go about asking them questions about their mental health. So again I'll put another quick poll up and if you can click on the box on the right. Oh. Right, this is coming the opposite way around, where I say the majority are saying that they haven't had any um, training. And from the questionnaire that I ran with the midwives, there were about 31% of the midwives stated they'd had some training of looking after women's mental health. Um, but a lot of this related to the drugs and alcohol and abuse um, safeguarding rather than specific to mental health. I'll just publish that result. So yes, about 66%, so about two thirds saying that they've had no training. So I think that's that's similar to the results from this study. Thank you very much for joining in with that. Okay. And out of those, um, the midwives that are saying they'd had some training, only 21% felt it helped in practice. And I'll go on to talk a bit more about that towards the end of the um, slides. Uh, and about 95% of the midwives are actually asking for more support. So women were midwives, the midwives mixed up. The midwives were offered a questionnaire and had about 145 questionnaires completed. 
Um, it was asking about their skills, knowledge of looking after women with um, mental health issues. So most women, look, most midwives had looked after women with anxiety and depression. But about 80% felt their colleagues were out of depth when they were um, faced with women with poor mental health. And about half of the midwives thought that pre problems were not recognised in um, mental health problems were not recognised in women. Uh, midwives suggested various ways of observing um, women's mental health, so they wouldn't necessarily ask outright, but they might look at moods, anxiety levels, availability of support, look at the women's mental health history um, as, as ways of sort of assessing women's mental health. It wasn't just a, a single question. Um, and they suggested perhaps clinical experience and instinct, play, instinct played a part in assessing women's mental health. So the focus groups, which sort of added on to the questionnaire, there were similar questions in them, but it allowed more time just to ask the questions in a bit more depth. So the focus groups aim to expand on the um, topics of discussion. Three focus groups, the total of 15 midwives. One of the groups was specialist team of midwives, and one of them was a group of newly qualified midwives who had only been in health board for a couple of weeks. Um, and the other one was sort of a mixture of midwives from various areas. So we were talking about how they asked questions and similar to the questionnaire, they were talking about um, asking about um, sort of observing women. One were midwife suggested observing the behaviour when she listened to the baby's heartbeat as a way of working out if women were bonding, um, which I thought was a, a good way of assessing um, moods and emotions. And the midwives in the specialist team who look after vulnerable women they said they felt comfortable about asking questions but they were still worried about whether they were doing it right and this became a bit of a theme throughout the um, discussions with midwives um, and the newly qualified midwives thought that the there is a question in our notes and they thought that the way that we, some of the midwives were asking it sounded a bit like a tick box exercise and that it wasn't part of a natural conversation and they thought perhaps this stopped the conversations with women um, about their mental health. Some midwives suggested it, they should be rephrased. So there was a lot of discussion about how to talk to women, how to ask women about mental health. None of the women actually mentioned using the um, screening tools that are recommended in the United Kingdom, which are the Edinburgh Postnatal Suppression Scale and the General Anxiety 7, um, as well as a few others, but that wasn't brought up by any of the, um, the midwives. Um, and similar to the women midwives mentioned that appointments were actually on the mainly focused on the physical side of pregnancy of, of the mother and baby and that there was also a limited time to expand those conversations into emotional um, side of pregnancy and another issue that came up was um, midwives were, didn't have that information they needed to discuss medication. A lot of women were coming up to them and asking about the medication, should they carry on? Was it okay for the baby? Um, and midwives are not, certainly in our area, are not taught about that. And then the midwives were worried because they were sending them off to the general practitioner um, and the general practitioners were sometimes stopping the medication and that worried the midwives and perhaps sent the, you know, the women's emotional side of their life um, became worse rather than better. So that, that was another issue that came up. Um, and midwives in the specialist team were explaining how the complex lives of these vulnerable women, it was difficult to know what support to give these women. Um, and even the perinatal mental health team have, they can only take a very few women on and they don't want to take women on that perhaps having problems with post-traumatic stress. There's some asylum seekers that have had traumatic pasts. Um, so they had a lot of, issues with trying to get support for these more vulnerable women um, and because the specialist team tend to look after these more vulnerable women there was a sense that midwives every everyday midwives the majority of midwives felt uncomfortable talking to women with severe mental health issues um, because they didn't have that experience that these specialist midwives had and that left a bit of a gap in their in their ability to care for these women um, and made them uncomfortable and not confident. 
And the other issue which came up, um, the title I think that came up from one of the midwives who summed up how she felt this whole issue about talking to women and perinatal mental health. She said there was a need for midwives, um, for midwives to support women's mental health. They needed training for midwives and support for women. Um, and overall, this seems to be one of the main themes that's come out. So midwives are very keen um, to support women in all aspects, physical and mental health, but they felt ill-equipped to prepare and to provide this care for mothers and their emotional well-being. They were afraid of making things worse by saying the wrong thing. They felt their training had not provided them for the everyday practical skills um, to provide the care for women's emotional health, and they felt their training was mostly on the physical health. Um, and there didn't appear to be much difference between the newly qualified midwives and experienced midwives either, which was I thought perhaps the newly qualified midwives might have felt more competent. There was a bit of difference, but not a huge amount. And what was even more, I don't know, worrying was the specialist community midwives who look after these women that are, are vulnerable. They hadn't had much more training than other midwives, um, but I think they had that experience. They sort of learned on the job. Um, and then this other issue of providing support. Midwives weren't too sure where they could ask women for more support they weren't you know they knew they could send them to the general practitioner the health visitors are sometimes able to help out and there were some online apps um, but there was not much counseling for women if they sent them to the general practitioner and they tended to end up on medication um, so there was another gap where midwives were unsure of what to um, how to support these women so in conclusion um, women Note, it was noted to have a bit of a lack of knowledge. They were not sure if their emotions were normal. They were not aware of mental health problems, perhaps that they could occur in pregnancy, and they need information on well-being and perhaps when to seek help. There seemed to be an emphasis on women and babies' physical health at the antenatal appointment, and some women reported that as long as the baby was well and they were reassured, they seemed unconcerned about their own mental and physical health. There was a lack of continuity appointment at appointments. Um, and midwives and women also mentioned that knowing each other, the, the midwives could observe the changes and mood and perhaps improved communication when they've got you know, a trusting relationship and enabled conversations about mental health and um, because there's still some stigma around that topic. And the lack of time at appointments also made this worse. Um, and midwives were overwhelmingly keen to provide this support for women, but they appear to lack confidence discussing mental health issues. And this resulted in them not asking questions as they were worried they could make the situation worse or they were unable to know what to do if women disclosed an issue. And they suggested further training to prepare them to support women's mental health. I mean, it was the practical training they were asking for, not the theoretical. They wanted training on how to speak to women. Um, they wanted training on medication. Um, and services as well. There were long waits for counselling um, and GPs were unsure of medication. The perinatal mental health team only support women with severe mental health conditions. So there was this concern that midwives, um, they need resources and a plan of when to send, where to send women and what advice they can give them so that they feel supported when it's beyond the role of the midwife. Um, so that's it from me. I'd like to thank you very much for listening and thank the VIDM for allowing me to share my study filings. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Ali and there's probably still some time for questions if anyone has any. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much Nicola for that comprehensive introduction to your PhD study and what an interesting topic to have looked at. We did have a question from Catherine do you think that some of these issues, I think for women having a lack of knowledge or understanding could be addressed with better education in schools now that we live less with extended family and in close communities? Well, that's a good question. I hadn't actually thought of that anywhere in my, my topics of conversation with anyone. Um, I think certainly talking about mental health in general, um, I know there's a lot more in the media in, in the UK that I've picked up on talking about, you know, men's mental health and you see the football mental health support groups. Um, 
there's not much talked on perhaps on perinatal mental health at the moment but certainly i don't see any problem with it starting with education in school um just talking about mental health like we talk about physical health and how sports important um to children um i think there is a little bit more now in schools am um, i involved at a high school and i know there is talk about bringing mental health education in so hopefully this will you know will help um as well as the general public becoming more aware of mental health issues through the media yeah thank you it was an interesting question <laughs> if anyone else has any questions please feel free to put them in the public chat we have some time now for questions nicola i wonder if from your research whether you think that training of midwives um, in these kind of lower grade mental health problems that women might come to them with mm -hmm. is important or whether having a specialised service, I know we have perinatal mental health for the higher level mental health problems that women might come to us with, but do you think there needs to be a specialist service for the lower levels or is it just training for midwives that's important? Um, I would say I think it's a bit of both. I think that all midwives need some sort of background training. And I know there is training in undergraduate and maybe a bit in postgraduate level. But the midwives were asking for the very practical aspects of how to speak to women. And every midwife does have to approach women and ask them about their physical and mental health. And um, so I think they need training on, on that practical aspect and having more confident um, confidence in speaking to women. Um, and yeah, I still, I think there needs to be a service as well for women. We've got a service in the obstetric um, assessment unit where women can ring up if they haven't felt the baby move or if they've got a bit of a pain in their tummy, but they ha we haven't got that system for women to ring up and say, you know, I'm unsure about, there could be obstetric midwifery type of issues. Um, I'm, you know, I've been diagnosed with centre previa, it's making me anxious. So there's very practical issues for women as well as the general anxieties that they may you know have um, i know there are some services around the country there's lots of different services in different areas that run in different ways but i think there needs to be something what it is and um, what works best i don't know at the moment but um, it's hopefully something i can look into in the future thank you caroline is asking would you think the the lack of confidence for midwives in supporting women with mental health issues could perhaps be linked to some level of personal stigma and bias that they may have? Yes, I, I suppose it could be, yeah. Um, I mean, I have seen midwives say quite derogatory things about women sometimes and sort of say, oh, that's, you know, batty woman over there or that, you know, I have heard derogatory comments and I was initially shocked and thought, oh my goodness, that's awful. But having done this study, I begin to realise that I think midwives are actually scared of of women because they haven't got that experience. So I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I lost the question slightly there. Um, it was just about the the midwives' own personal experience. Yeah, I mean, it could be, and perhaps you know, if there is more training, that's a topic that could come up in the training, and um, midwives might become more aware that it's a personal issue. You know, and there might be some way of having a one to one conversation with a trainer to discuss those issues. Yeah, yeah, could well be. And another question that's come up from a few people is, did the midwives or the women mention anything about continuity of carer being an, an asset really for their mental health support? Yes, there was a lot from women and midwives about continuity. Um, and I know it's something we're trying to bring in in this England, well, all over the UK, and Wales as well. Um, the women felt that, I mean, I think some of them have about nine appointments with midwives and quite often it's a different midwife at at least half of those appointments and they didn't feel they could build up a relationship. So they, they didn't feel comfortable discussing their emotional side of pregnancy. They just went in, did all the physical checks and then left again. Um, and then for the midwives as well, they felt it was very important because they could build up a relationship with women and they could observe women. So once they found out initially about the woman and about her issues or the way, you know, way of life and the pregnancy, um, they could actually assess on the next meeting whether they looked any more happier or, you know, their moods had dropped. 
um, and also meant they didn't have to ask all those initial you know hello questions at the beginning of each meeting as well so it would reduce the time so it was definitely a very important issue there's an interesting comment from um Maeve there about in current COVID-19 times women are perhaps finding virtual appointments scary and lacking and could increase anxiety mm. mental health problems and that obviously could be something that we have to think about going forward yes I know locally the NSPCC um, the National um, Children's Charity they've actually um, set up an on system for nursing mothers um, specifically to talk about their emotional health. I don't know what it's like the rest of the country or the rest of the world. Um, but yes, I think it is a recognised with, with everyone, not just pregnant women, <laughs> anyone who's uh, self-isolating. Yeah. And there was a question just a little bit earlier on, if I can find mm -hmm. it from Sophie, saying that in community midwifery that she's experienced um, in the UK, many midwives are tied to 20 minute or 30 minute appointments maximum. Mm -hmm. And is it feasible for non-specialist mental health midwives to provide that mental health support and the routine care that they're expected to in that time frame? Yeah, I think what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about the antenatal appointments, it's more not providing perhaps support for emotions, but allowing women to talk about their emotions because women are saying that just talking actually helps them therapeutically and the midwife not, might not be able to spend a long time talking to them and they might have to refer on to other services but they need to have that initial conversation because if they don't ask women about their mental health they're never going to find out and women quite often won't disclose they, you know there's been a lot of research saying women need to be asked um, so it's just broaching that subject and sometimes just the fact that someone has asked them a question and they can you know quickly tell a midwife about the issues and um, that just helps in itself and with continuity it would mean that the midwife can follow up on that as well um, so yeah sometimes they do need to be you know sent to someone else but it's that every day remembering that you are supporting their emotional side as well just when you're talking to them when you're asking questions um, just being concerned about their emotional side is, I think is part of it Thank you, Nicola. I think we've come to the end of our time for questions. So I just want to say um, a formal thank you from the VIDM for presenting your PhD so wonderfully here. And I think this is only going to become an even bigger issue for midwives across the world. I know from the UK perspective, it's becoming more prevalent on social media that women, men need to talk about their mental health issues and as healthcare professionals, we need to be there to support them. So this is going to be really valuable research for us, I think, moving forward. So thank you, Nicola.